Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We have our uh, first series together that uh, we are starting today. It's beginning livestock series, intro to livestock. So we're going to talk lots of livestock things next uh, upcoming um, seven weeks, including this week. Uh, just want to let you know, um, we have your microphones off or you're, you're muted as well. Uh, so if you have any questions, we'll be monitoring the chat box as well. And uh, we'll take some time at the end for questions. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, advance the slide and we can get going. So uh, we have some uh, nice pictures of ourselves here. We've got uh, myself, I'm Michelle Prosha. I'm the CC educator out of uh, Sullivan County. We have Grace Ott, who is the educator out of Orange County and Steph Herbstritt with us, who is the educator out of Ulster County. So combined, we are uh, a regional group that um, we're gonna be working together and uh, doing a lot of different series. So uh, we welcome uh, you joining us today. Just a <clears throat> reminder here, we are doing an eight part series. So um, this first one is gonna be kind of a brief overview of stuff that we're gonna be talking about. And then we're gonna delve deeper into individual species and forage throughout the next uh, um, seven, eight weeks here. So obviously if you've registered, um, uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> and that one-time registration covers the entire series. Um, so you're able to join us um, on all of these and we will be recording. So you can uh, review uh, another time and uh, you know look back on the notes. Okay. Uh, just to be aware, we do have some other uh, upcoming livestock programs for our region. Uh, we are having a profitable meat marketing webinar with uh, Matt LaRue, who will be coming down uh, on May 18th from six to eight. And that's gonna be held over at the Finchville Turnpike uh, Orange County Education Center in Odell. Um, there's no cost to attend. Uh, we're looking forward to getting back out to some more in-person uh, uh, programming. It's been a, it's been a, a while, so uh, uh, we hope to uh, meet y'all out there and uh, join us for um, some interesting talks on meat marketing. In addition, we have a lovely emo talk coming up. Uh, and that's gonna be out on May 26th. This one is virtual and there is no cost to attend. Um, and it's going to be on Thursday, uh, you know, during the lunch hour, May 26th from 12 to one. That's a reminder. Okay, getting into it now. Um, just a couple things here that we're gonna cover. Uh, so like I said, this is gonna be an overview of, um, you know, uh, just just skimming the surface of, of some of the top here. But sure. Talk you didn't now. say it out loud. I'm trying to figure out how to do this, baby. Do what? We're going to talk about uh, some regulations, environmental factors, infrastructure needs, uh, breed selection. Of course, we're going to harp on you pretty much every uh, week here. We're going to talk about biosecurity planning, but we're also going to talk about it today. We want to make sure that uh that point kind of just driven home emergency planning environmental management and of course financial planning as well so uh, a lot to talk about today um, again if you have any questions as we go through throw them in the chat box or we can uh we can talk about it at the end so first off here uh regulations so what um Regulations uh, can be breed specific. Uh, so we will go into some of the different breed specific uh, regulations in terms of uh, maybe processing meat, things like that. Um, but the number one thing that I wanted to kind of drive home today, um, if you're a beginning farmer, new farmer, uh, if you're expanding, if you're just purchasing property to become a farmer, uh, the number one rule and the number one thing that I talk about always first is to check with your municipality to see which uh, laws apply to you. So can you have animals on your property that you that you have? How many animals? Are there any restrictions? Uh, things like road setbacks for fencing, lot size, and if there's any requirements for your signage, do you need any site plans? 
just different things to check out before you go ahead and spend money or purchase animals or, you know, move. Uh, definitely need to check that out ahead of time. Um, if you need help doing so, uh, you can call one of us or uh, there is a website called, um, you know, eCode360, which if you, you know, type in your municipality or your um, town, it should be able to bring up your, um, you know, town zoning code for that. So you can look through there. But again, double check ahead of time to make sure that what you want to do, you're able to do on that property. Um, in addition, there's something called um, agriculture districts. And depending on your county, um, there's a 30 day open window to join ag districts. And generally farms that are in an ag district uh, are most, mostly exempt for many uh, local and state regulations, including the seeker, which is uh, state environmental quality review, some building codes. Um, you may be exempt from providing stamped plans for farm buildings. Um, if you wanna learn more or uh, know how to apply or see if you're in an ag district, uh, you can contact your county planning office or your extension office or see the link here at the bar bottom to know more about it. Um, I know for Sullivan County, our window just ended. It's usually in um, April. So April 1st through April 30th is when you're able to apply. Um, and, you know, we can check with the other counties to see when that would be available to you. We're gonna be talking a lot of, uh, about New York State Ag and Markets. We always uh, refer back to them. Uh, you know, we always look at their website. They are a government agency and their whole goal or mission is to promote New York State Ag. So they're trying to make sure that the state food supply, land and livestock are all safe. Um, they have different rules and regulations um, for the state itself, and it helps ensure the viability and growth of the state's ag industry, which as if you are farming, uh, that is something that you're going to be doing um, as far as um, being a good steward of land, being um, a good steward of farming as well. All right, so I know that we are talking about livestock, but I would be remiss if we didn't talk about um, soil considerations uh, as it relates to um, pasture, forage, crops like that, because inevitably, if you have livestock, you're probably going to be grazing them on grass. Uh, not always, but, but mostly here. It's, it's one of the benefits of our region is we have some great grasses. Um, but if you're purchasing property uh, or wanting to know more about your soil, some things to look for is kind of the texture the pH, the fertility that's available from the, uh, from the soil, and of course, drainage. So since we've had a pretty uh, wet couple months, it seems like forever, maybe, you know, maybe I'll call it a year, um, now would be a good time to go out and kind of assess uh, what your pastures look like and see how they are in terms of drainage, if you're seeing any wet spots, um, things like that. So it's always good to do a visual on that. Um, for high value crops or crops, uh, forages that you're using to feed your livestock, um, knowing your pH fertility, that sort of thing is pretty cr critical. Um, for hay and pasture, it is, uh, it, I'll say quote unquote less critical, but um, it will help you get the best bang for your buck in terms of being able to feed uh, your livestock in that, in that sense. So. This is one of my favorite uh, kind of pictures here uh, as far as I guess um, graphs could go or well, I guess not really a graph, but anyway, uh, when you're talking about soil considerations and you're talking about pH um, of the soil, there's kind of a sweet spot and you're looking at somewhere around six, six, two to 6.8 where all the nutrients are available to be um, taken up uh, into the plant itself. So whether that's pasture or crops, and if it's, you know, too acidic or too alkaline on, on that sense, uh, the plant itself won't be able to absorb the nutrients, um, which helps it grow, helps it uh, have good um, protein value. So you want your soil pH to kind of 
be in that six uh, to six, five, six, eight, somewhere in there. Uh, alternately, um, I know we're talking livestock, but if you're growing blueberries, that this is not the sweet spot that you're going for. You're going to be wanting to go for more acidic. But just to let you know that the idea of um, different crops uh, need different pHs as well. So how do we figure this out? Uh, one of the main things after, you know, we talk about uh, figuring out what you're able to do on your property is seeing how your soil is. So we recommend getting a soil test uh, at our office. We send them up to Agro One uh, up in Ithaca and you'll be able to figure out your nutrients, uh, recommendations for your soil amendments with lime and fertilizer. It'll show pH and the recommendations usually go out about three years. So it'll be able to tell you uh, what to do for your soil for the next three years. And generally they're around 13 or 18 bucks depending on what you're testing for. Uh, another uh, map here uh, that this does affect um, our region differently. You can see with the Ulster, Sullivan and Orange, we have uh, about three different um, uh, hardiness zones here on, on the map, you know, it goes from the green to the blue, uh, to the, I guess, violet, purple. So each of those affect um, crop growth. So they each have minimum temps, frost-free days, growing degree days, and different precipitations at certain points. So <clears throat> if you're growing crops or anything uh, or forage for your livestock, is just to be aware that, you know, generally wherever you live could, could affect your crops differently. Okay. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna go over um, some of the different infrastructure needs you can think about that are specific to your property. Um, some of the things I'm gonna go over are um, pasture fencing, whether that's around your pasture or around like a smaller lot, um, water access, and as well as um, shelter needs for the different animals. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so first I'm gonna go over some things with space requirements. And um, there's a couple of different ways that we can look at um, what the requirements are and how many animals that we can fit in a certain area. Um, we can think about it in terms of how many animals will fit like in an acre or in that space. And then kind of the more scientific and technical way of thinking about it is looking at it by animal units. And so one animal unit is equal to 1000 pounds of animal. And this is a way that we can kind of normalize um, and be able to compare on uh, different animals. So in this case, um, it, the number of animals like per animal unit also varies by the size of the animal as you would expect um, for cattle. Generally the um, average mature weight for a cow is about 12 to 1500 pounds. So they would be 1.2 to uh, 1.5 animal units just, um, just in average, uh, whereas sheep would only be about like 0.2 animal units. Um, next slide. I um, mean, so animal units generally is thought of more um, for like in terms of pasture space, whereas if you're in like a pen or more confined area, you're thinking more of um, how many animal, like how many square feet each animal needs. Um, but for general rule of thumb, um, when you're thinking about pasture, you're generally thinking more uh, in terms of cattle, sheep and goats, because um, they are predominantly grazers. And those are the ones that the ruminants they need, they really need the grass. Um, but the rule of thumb is about one cow per acre um, or four to five sheep or goats. But we also need to think about not just how many animals can you fit in the space, but also how do you manage um, your pastures? How do you want to organize um, your grazing system for the benefit of the animals as well as the pasture? And so traditionally, um, what we think of as continuous grazing is um, just having those animals all in one pasture all the time. They don't ever go to different pastures. They're just eating whatever is available to them in there. But over the past few decades, um, there's definitely a growing movement to start doing um, rotational and strip grazing, which are more intensive management, but do have a lot of benefits for um, the environment on your farm. So rotational grazing is where you are have the animals in uh, one paddock and then you let them graze to a height of you know about three to four inches of the grass and then you move them to a different paddock. Um, strip grazing has a kind of similar um, idea but they are maybe in 
um, one just in one pasture and you're letting them into different sections of that pasture, allowing them more space um, as you go. And so some of the benefits of this are in continuous grazing systems, um, cattle and sheep, they can kind of be a little picky with the plants that they're eating. And um, so they don't, they want to eat just the ones, you know, the more desirable, the ones that taste better to them. And if they have continuous access to all of that, they're going to eat those and they're not going to eat the weeds um, that are less desirable. Maybe they have a different texture and they don't want to do that. And they have that option since they ha have all that space available. But in rotational and strip grazing systems, they only have that small area and they have to eat everything that's in that area before they get moved on. So then they are eating the weeds and the less desirable plants, um, which means less weed pressure. The weeds aren't going to thrive um, because they are being eaten with the rest. And then also rotating gives time for the to be regrowth and to let the pastures rest. Um, additionally, these offer um, soil health of benefits as well, due to using rotational and strip grazing, because the cows don't, cows or sheep, they don't have specific pathways that they're walking all the time to get to water, to get to shelter, and so they're not eroding the ground in those areas that they walk on, and they're not compacting the soil um, as much in those areas. Okay, next slide. And so whether you have a pasture system or whether you just have animals in like smaller pens or lots, fencing is absolutely critically important for keeping your animals contained. Because if your animals get out and they cause damage on other property, then you're responsible for that damage. Um, also, you don't want your animals getting out on the road where they can get hurt. Um, and then you don't, you also don't want to just lose animals that you've, you know, spent money on and you've uh, taken care of all this time. So it's really very important that you have them fenced in um, and they aren't able to um, break out of that. There's a lot of different, um, oh, there's a lot of different types of um, fencing that you can use, a lot of different options depending on how much you want to spend and how durable you think that your fence needs to be. Um, as you can see in the pictures, there's, um, you have board fences, there's wire fences. Um, the two pictures kind of bottom um, bottom right are electric. So there's like a woven wire electric fence, which you can see the um, solar panel charger um, to provide electricity, as well as the wire fence um, you can see in the very bottom right. And so those are all examples of uh, permanent structures. Um, with the electric fences, they are really effective at even if you don't have the whole fence electric, but maybe having a couple strands um, to be able to deter the animals from trying to, uh, you know, test the waters a little bit with. Uh, the fencing if they just decide they want to. And then as I talked about with rotational strip grazing, one way of doing that is um, temporary fencing, which are portable, as you can see the bottom left picture. I'm utilizing those step-in posts and uh, poly wire that is uh, really flexible, can be rolled up and moved to wherever you need it in whatever shape you want to do it. And then every you know couple days or uh, every day or every couple days you can then move those boundaries, or even you could also use it to create alleyways to um, move your cattle into other areas. And the USDA um, National Resource Conservation Service has a document that has fence technical standards. If you're interested, we can send you that um, to be able to look at kind of their recommendations for uh, constructing fences. Um, I would also recommend that if you don't already have fences on your property and you don't have experience putting up fences, that it probably would be best to at least for the perimeter fence around the property to hire someone to uh, get that professionally put in. And that would be expen more expensive than doing it yourself, but you really wanna make sure that you have a sturdy fence. Okay. And so then going into um, other specifics uh, for animal needs, um, water is absolutely uh, very critical for animals. They, it's the most important nutrient and they need to have access to it at all times. So you really need to think about how you're going to make that available to them. Um, so beef cattle uh, drink about three to 30 gallons every single day. So they're gonna require the most needs. Uh, sheep and goats about, sheep and goats and then hogs drink a few gallons, um, you know, maybe somewhere from two to five. I think sheep and goats are like one to two gallons a day. Uh, pigs more like two to five. And then chickens, obviously being the smallest, they drink the least at about one pint a day. But Regardless, you need to make sure that they have that because they're 
our needs for water also will fluctuate based on things like the environmental factors, like temperature, humidity, um, what stage of production they're in. If you have lactating animals, they're going to need a lot more water, um, body size, as well as if you're grazing animals, the moisture content of the grass will also have an effect. Um, so here's a couple also different pictures of some different options. Um, if you have like a hose or a spigot available in your pasture, um, you can just fill a tub, you know, every day, twice a day. Um, in the bottom left, there are, um, I, think, I, don't know if a, I think it's a brand name, it's Mirror Fount, but they're automatic waters. So you can see the cattle will be pushing that uh, blue ball down to get into the water. And those also are resistant to freezing, which is really important. Um, pigs and uh, poultry can use nibble waters. Um, for the pigs, you can see that is a nibble water on basically what is the PVC pipe, which is really nice because they can't uh, dump that and make a big mess in their pen, which is really nice. Um, but you also need to think about um, it, what's going to happen when it's cold um, in the freezing temperatures. If it's just, you know, around freezing, maybe you can just break the ice. But if it's getting down to, you know, 15, 20 degrees, then that ice might be a little too thick for the animals to be able to break through themselves. So um, definitely think about the possibility of getting water tubs that have heaters in them. Um, these, those automatic waters in the picture, they generally are resistant to freezing, as I said. Um, and you can also, um, you can just buy like heaters to put in the water, but you also have to make sure that um, you have power to that area. Okay. So then for shelter wise, I'm not going to go into exactly how much space because we have a document that we can just send you. Um, and it'd be probably fairly boring for you to sit here and read, for me to read a bunch of numbers off. Um, but they do, your animals do need some kind of shelter to protect them from the elements, um, whether that's a barn or a shed, or um, you can see the bottom picture that's just a shade structure, um, which works well in the summertime, but you don't want to just rely on that in the winter because they really need um, a windbreak in a more enclosed area, particularly for things like pigs and um, poultry. Um, as Michelle said, with uh, zoning, you also want to make sure you check your local regulations for your town before you construct any um, buildings on your property if you don't already have them. And some other things to consider are, are you going to need um, electrical power out to there? Do you want to have plates for when you're feeding in the nighttime? Um, if you're raising like sheep and goats or maybe a cow or two and you're trying to milk them, if you don't want to hand milk, you need power to be able to run a milking system. Um, and then for uh, pigs or if you have maybe lambs born when it's cold, you're going to want to have heat lamps um, for them as well. And so, oh, and also um, we want to think about possibly a bedding if it's really cold. Um, you're going to want to have more bedding for animals to keep them warm, particularly for pigs. And the, if you just have kind of a shade structure out in the pasture, bedding isn't really that important. But if you had it, any kind of hard floor, or if it's you know winter, you don't want um, the you know you don't want mud to pile up in the barn and things like that. Okay. And then just a couple of, like specific things to think about for the different species. Um, obviously, cattle are the biggest, so they need the most space. They're going to be the most, uh, possibly the most expensive to feed, um, and they're going to require the most resources and the strongest fencing. Um, for sheep and goats, uh, you should definitely consider using uh, woven wire fences rather than just um, wire strands, because if they think they can get out, they will try to get out. And if they can squeeze through, then you're going to have a problem. Um, for swine, mainly uh, the issue for them, as well as needing strong fences for them because they are very strong with their noses and can be very destructive. Um, you also want to make sure you're protecting them from the elements. Um, they have really sensitive skin. And so if they're in the sun all summertime, they're going to get sunburned. Um, and they really, they also don't really sweat. So they really need a place that they can get out of the sun um, and you know lay in the mud and cool off and cover their skin to make sure they're not getting sunburned. And on the flip side of that, they don't have very thick skin and um, they don't have a lot of fur. So they really need um, an enclosed space to go in the wintertime that's cold and a lot of bedding. And um, if you have piglets then definitely make sure that they have a heat lamp um, because otherwise, you know, you don't want them um, getting a chill. Uh, for poultry, you also need to make sure that they have an enclosed space, but for a slightly different reason, um, you wanna make sure that they have a space to go at night that 
can protect them from predators. So giving them a coop that you can shut them into at night, making sure there aren't a lot of like holes where you know foxes can get in. And then giving them perches to sit on and as well as nest boxes where they can lay eggs if that's what you are raising them for. Okay. Um, and as I said, if you want um, more specifics for um, when you're doing your planning for how big your structures need to be or how many animals you can fit in the structure you already have, and we have those space requirements specifically for how much room each species needs um, in that structure. So we will send that out. Okay. Um, and so I'm not going to get into different nutritional requirements because we're kind of going to break that out into uh, when we do our species specific uh, presentations. But you do have to think about um, if you're giving supplemental feed, what kind of trough space you have or um, what different troughs you can buy. There's a couple different examples of feeders in the pictures here. And you also need to make sure that you know where you can get feed, whether that's from a local feed and like farm equipment store or some farmers might um, make their own feed that you can buy as well. And then specifically for grazing animals, you also wanna make sure that they have access to um, some kind of minerals that you're putting out for them because just grass alone, it's not going to meet all of their um, mineral needs. If you're, like if you have pigs that are just mainly eating a, um, mainly eating like a grain-based feed, that's not as important because it's probably gonna have um, minerals within that feed. So you should check to be able to make sure. Um, but having these mineral feeders, um, you can see in the bottom left picture, that's what that is. It's a mineral feeder with a tub. Ideally, you would have some kind of cover on it. Um, so the cattle can, or sheep and goats can still get into it, but it won't get um, really wet with rain, you know, like dissolving all the minerals that then they're not getting them. Um, a note though with sheep is you also, you want to make sure that any mineral that they have access to is specific just for sheep, because sheep cannot have um, copper in their mineral as they're very susceptible to copper toxicity, which can actually kill your sheep. So you want to make sure that if you have sheep in the same pen with cattle, that you're making sure that they don't have access to anything that has copper in it. Okay. And then kind of along the same lines um, for grazing animals, particularly, um, obviously the grass isn't growing in the wintertime and you, it's gonna be covered in snow even if um, it wanted to. Um, so you need to think about where you can get hay. Um, can you? Uh, buy it from somewhere locally? Can you make it yourself? Do you have the equipment or are you willing to buy the equipment? And then in some cases, if you have the land for it, maybe you can um, kind of have a farmer like renting that land to make hay and then you get, you know, a percentage of whatever they make on your property or, you know, whether that's number of bales or percentage. And then you also need to think about, um, this is particularly with cattle, who, if you have several cattle that you maybe want to it's more effective to feed brown bales. You need to have like a tractor to be able to feed those. Um, if you just have sheep and goats, maybe you can get away with the square bales and those aren't too um, bad to carry usually. But here's a couple of examples of different feeders. Um, you do have the option of putting the hay just out on the ground, but um, that they, they do generate a lot of waste doing that with their trampling the hay or they're laying it like bedding. And so that's then, you know, hay and money that's just being wasted. So you really want to have a way to feed it that they can't, um, that they're gonna eat most of it and not just destroy most of it. Okay. And so the final kind of infrastructure thing that you really need to think about when planning for animals is having a space that you can handle them safely. Um, whether that's for uh, when you're trying to load them onto a trailer and you're bringing them in or having a confined area where you can give them routine vaccinations. Um, you can have your vet check them out, um, maybe treat them if they're sick. And so here's a couple of examples of different shoots. Uh, the red one is size for cattle and the blue one is for sheep and goats. Um, you can also buy just the head gate part, but either way you need a way to restrain the animal so you can safely handle them. Um, for pigs, it's a little bit harder. Sometimes you can get little shoot systems, but having them having a smaller pen um, that you maybe can corner them in um, is always a good idea. Uh, and also you can, uh, just a thought, in some cases also you can 
um, if you have a gate that's near a wall and you can get them in the corner and swing the gate and tie it, and that can be a simple way, um, but you have to make sure that you know it's strong enough, the walls are strong enough and things like that to be able to hold it because animals aren't really a fan of being confined like that. Okay. So now I'm just gonna talk um, just briefly about some different factors to consider um, when trying to pick breeds. I'm not really gonna go into a lot of specifics for that because there are so many breeds that would be, um, it could take up the whole rest of this time. And so we can try to break that up a little bit more in our um, more specific presentations later on. But you wanna think about, you know, why do you wanna have these animals? Do you want to raise them for meat to sell? Do you wanna raise them for meat just for your family? Are you interested in milking um, cattle or goats or sheep? Um, so what is your, what is the purpose of these animals? Um, in some cases now it's a growing um, industry to do agritourism. So do you want like breeds that look interesting or not very common for people to come in and look at and like learn about? And so do you have a market for um, whatever product you're trying to sell? And so of course, when considering what species and also breed that you're trying to get, um, you wanna take in, you wanna think about the space you have available and the potential expenses. So obviously cattle need the biggest space um, and are gonna be the most expensive, but even within breed, there are also some factors to consider. Um, for example, Charlet cattle have a mature weight about you know, 15, 1600 pounds. So they're gonna need more resources than an Angus or a Hereford. That's only gonna be about 1200 pounds. And with goats, there's a big difference between like a 200, 250 pound boar goat and an 80 pound Nigerian dwarf. So you have to also take that into consideration. And there's also um, in kind of the, you know, in smaller farms, there's a growing interest in heritage breeds. So that's another thing to consider. Um, so heritage breeds are breeds that have traditionally, like in the past, you know, 100, 200 years ago, um, were the predominantly on um, the breeds that were raised before um, kind of the agriculture system changed to be a little, to be more um, large scale and look at efficiency and raising particular breeds that are going to be able to produce the most product for um, you know people that aren't in farming anymore. You know, previously just about everybody had a pig in that backyard, and so it doesn't matter as much like what the efficiency of it was, as long as it you know got the market weight by whatever time to feed one family for a year. Um, and so sometimes people um, are interested in these heritage breeds just because they like the history aspect of it. Um, a lot of these also are you know there's not many left, so they're maybe interested in conserving the breeds and keeping them going. And then also in some cases, there is a demand for meat or milk specifically from different breeds. So um, it's what, it could be another way to, you know, maybe add something unique to your farm as well. All right, so we have covered kind of a lot of the things that you need to plan for that you might've already thought of, or maybe not, zoning, environmental considerations, infrastructure. Now we're gonna transition into some of the things that you need to plan for that maybe you haven't considered yet. So first up is biosecurity. So what is biosecurity? And biosecurity is practices that we implement on farms, off farms to keep diseases and disease causing organisms away from livestock, but also away from our equipment, uh, plants, people and the environment. And zoonotic diseases are diseases that spread between animals and people. And one thing to keep in mind is biosecurity is a gradient. So you're never fully secure or insecure. And Michelle, you're gonna have to click a lot through these slides. There's lots of um, animation. But you know what you do is going to make you and your livestock and your facility more or less secure. And there's really three basic levels of biosecurity. There's conceptual, structural, and operational or procedural. So the primary level, the conceptual level, really revolves around where you locate your livestock facilities. So not siting your farm next to a slaughterhouse, limiting personnel and visitors. <clears throat> Structural is that next level that deals with physical factors like the layout of the housing, the fencing that you're using, how you're keeping wild critters out of your chicken coop, for example. And then the operational, that tertiary level really deals with those routine procedures that you're gonna plan for and implement to prevent introduction and spread of infection on your farm. So things like washing your hands, hanging footwear and personal clothes changes. 
So does it matter? Is it important? Yes, the answer is yes. Biosecurity has been, next slide please, has been a great resource across the United States. Strong biosecurity programs are one of the best ways that we continue to protect livestock and others against infectious disease. Um, some examples are national eradication programs that we have in the United States, keeping African swine fever out. And most recently, you may have heard of the highly um, pathogenic avian influenza outbreak, which is happening across the United States, including in New York State. And the United States Department of Agriculture has some great resources on how livestock owners can defend their flocks. So biosecurity is really important and it keeps our agricultural markets moving and it keeps our country able to export um, to other countries. So it's super important and sometimes forgotten. So what can you do on your farm? So before you even start thinking about livestock, I suggest you think about biosecurity. You need to make a plan. So what does that look like? Well, first you wanna do some research, next slide, on identifying diseases of highest concern. So you can do some research, the United States Department of Agriculture's Animal um, Plant and Health Inspection Service has a lot of great resources. You can go to their website and we can put the link in the chat and try to understand what diseases are of highest concern for the livestock species you're planning to raise. You know, how high risk is that disease to your livestock at different ages, um, production stages, so whether they're lactating or not, and if you can reduce that risk through housing or co contact with other animals. Then you want to assess your facility or your planned facility and see if it's going to help prevent or reduce the risk of that disease. Um, a big part of making a biosecurity plan is considering the movement of your animals. So a closed herd is the most protected, but there are other ways to protect animals, and we can talk about that in more detail later in the series. And ultimately, you want to make sure that your plan has procedures that you then actually implement to eliminate, prevent, or minimize the potential impact of diseases of concern. Let's go through a few examples of what biosecurity might look like. So washing hands before and after working with livestock is a big one. Using animal identification tags. So you're gonna to wanna to tag your livestock so you know which livestock is which and you can track if one gets sick. You're gonna to wanna to check your livestock for disease regularly. So when you have livestock, like Grace mentioned, you're gonna be giving them water once, twice a day. Um, so when you're going out feeding, giving water, making sure everything's clean, you're also gonna to wanna to be checking your livestock and reporting any symptoms of disease. You can call your local county extension office, so our team, or you can report directly to New York State's Ag and Markets that Michelle talked about earlier. Um, another basic biosecurity practice is just keeping farm equipment, clothing, and boots clean. So changing your boots when you go from where your livestock are back into your house, changing your clothes when you're going from your neighbor's livestock facility to wherever you're keeping your livestock. And then finally, quarantining new animals before you bring them into your flock or herd is a great idea to make sure that those animals aren't sick and aren't gonna be spreading disease. And Michelle, if you click, there's a snip of the United States Department of Agriculture's Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service website. And I suggest you check that out before you start thinking about livestock. Another type of planning that we sometimes forget to consider when we're thinking about getting livestock is emergency planning. So what are you going to do when disaster strikes? And I'm talking about things like climate disasters, like flash flooding. So before something like that even happens and your livestock are in a situation where there might be a flash flood, you want to take a moment to prepare. You want to know what hazards and risks we have in our area. So flash flooding is a big one for a lot of our communities. Another issue is wiring safety. So you want to establish safe environments for your livestock from the get-go. So if you're using heat lamps, whenever you have lambs in the winter, you want to make sure that the wiring is safe and you're not going to cause a fire. 
Um, in the event that you need to evacuate your livestock from the area, maybe because of a flash flood, you want to have an evacuation kit ready to go with all of the things that your livestock are going to need. Again, you always want to have an inventory of the livestock that you have and make sure that those animals are identified and make sure you have a safe route to evacuate if you need to evacuate. And then of course, you know, you might not know where to start even. So there are two great resources. So USDA has a great checklist. Um, they, you can, we can send this to you. They have a disaster preparedness fact sheet and a corresponding checklist that you can go through and make sure you're ready. And another great resource is this Ready Ag Disaster and Defense Preparedness Kit. And that's also free to download and you can go through the workbook, go through the checklist and make sure you've thought of everything before an issue arises. So that's all before an emergency. During an emergency, you wanna implement your plan. Don't forget to do that. And then after an emergency, you really wanna stay informed. So keep up to date on what's happening. Follow the weather channel. Follow the newsletters that your um, county extension offices are sending out to let you know if something is imminent and stay informed. So Michelle, you can click a couple times. And then finally, you also want to plan for when you're away. So a lot of times, those of us who have livestock, sometimes we're the only ones that are taking care of those livestock at the beginning, maybe before operations grow. And so you want to have a plan. If you're going to be away, you have everything written down. Um, if something unexpectedly happens to you, is someone going to be there and be able to take care of those livestock? Okay, so that's some on disaster preparedness. Let's just do a high level overview of environmental management. So to be successful in the long term, every farm really needs to sustain or improve your natural resources, soil quality, water quality, your plant resources. You can't farm without these things. And your county extension office is a great resource to talk to about this, but you can also go through your county soil and water conservation district for help. They can help you advance your agricultural environmental management. And they can also provide information on grants, loans, cost share programs that might be available to you to help you implement conservation practices that might be um, costly and you wouldn't wanna do on your own. And so on this slide, we have the links to the Orange County, Sullivan County, and Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And you can also reach out to Grace, Michelle, and I if you need more information. Another great resource to check out while you're thinking about environmental management is the American Farmland Trust's New York Agricultural Landowner Guide. And so this resource is really fantastic because it talks in depth about environmental management. It shares some of the programs that we have across our state to help farmers protect soil and water resources. It gives you a lot of options to consider for conserving wetlands and also other wildlife habitat. Um, it talks about farm viability, especially in terms of sustainability. There are a lot of opportunities to look at energy. So Grace talked a lot about power. Um, we're going to need to keep the lights on, keep the heat lamps on. So we're going to need to get energy in a way and maybe in a way that doesn't increase greenhouse gas emissions. This guide also has a lot of great contact information for organizations um, in our counties and across the state that can help you achieve conservation goals. Now say you might not be interested in conservation goals. This isn't one of your goals. You're just here because you wanna start having a livestock facility. Well, I say this, we also have to consider environmental regulations. So as farmers, we have to comply with state and federal regulations. So here are a few that I think you need to know about and you should consider. So number one is New York State's water quality regulations. So farmers have to comply with these to protect both surface and groundwater from contamination. And when I say contamination, I mean from things like eroded soil, fecal coliforms, excessive nitrate and phosphorus levels. And if the Department of Environmental Conservation determines that you're the cause of a water quality violation, your farm can be subject to a fine and farming practices can be restricted or prohibited. So this is really important to keep in mind 
And this law applies to all landowners and farm operators. Another really important regulation to have in the back of your mind is the conservation of wetlands and highly erodible lands. So this is regulated and, and um, promoted or, or implemented by the Farm Service Agency and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And this is what you need to know. Activities that aren't allowed include planting a commodity on highly erodible land or a converted wetland or converting a wetland to make agricultural production possible. So if you have a really wet site, maybe call the Extension Office or the Soil and Water Conservation District and talk to them about it first. Um, there's also a map you can go to to identify whether the land that you're looking at is in a wetland or not. Other activities that aren't allowed include creating new drainage or modifying, improving, or maintaining existing drainage. So again, before you start digging, dredging, leveling, filling, land, um, clearing, or stump removal of trees, call someone in your county and talk to them about it. The Navigable Waters Law is also important. So the United States Army Corps of Engineers, often referred to as the Corps, they have regulatory authority over any temporary or permanent structure that's constructed in, over, or under navigable waters of the United States. So land clearing in a jurisdictional water will likely be regulated um, by the Corps under the Clean Water Act. So something to keep in mind. And then finally, pesticide application. So Michelle was talking about forage at the beginning of this presentation. You know, if you need to use herbicides, in your pastures, et cetera, um, you know, you need to follow the label. You need a certification to use restricted use pesticides. And just remember pesticide application laws do apply to organic production too. And we can share more information about that. Um, and just a few questions you might wanna ask yourself while you're looking at environmental management and planning. You know, how are you going to manage the nutrients on your farm? How are you gonna manage manure? What ecosystem services do you want to provide? Do you want to improve water quality in your watershed? What pollution risks do you want to minimize? Is there something that you're concerned about that you want to make sure you plan for? Um, if you're using herbicides, how are you going to store them? How will you limit your greenhouse gas emissions if you care about that? Um, do you have a bedded pack manure system? How are you going to reduce ammonia emissions? And a lot of great resources for helping you with this planning live on Cornell's Climate Smart Farming Team website. So I've just pasted a few of the tools here that I think you might find useful, but there's a lot to explore. So I highly recommend checking it out. In terms of um, disaster planning, there's some tools related to weather. Also in terms of looking at improving pastures, um, planting pastures, figuring out what to plant. There's a great Growing Degrees Day calculator, there's a winter cover crop planting scheduler and a lot of other great tools. So check out that website for more. And probably the most important, arguably the most important thing to consider is financial planning. So financing a farm is expensive. Maybe you're gonna lease land, maybe you're gonna buy land, maybe you're trying to figure that out. But here are just some general tips and information from Cornell. So, the most appropriate source for your new farm is using your own money if you have it. And just note that relying too much on loans does increase risk. Our small farms group at Cornell estimates that farms in New York can begin off 5,000 in cash, and that's whether on lease land or land you already own. And just note that, you know, when you're looking at leasing land versus purchasing land, if you're leasing land, that would reduce the need for additional startup capital. And if you're purchasing land, a really good guideline is don't spend or don't plan to spend more than 50% of what you have available on the land itself, because you're going to need funds um, saved for infrastructure and equipment and other startup needs. And another great tip is when you're starting a, a livestock farm, it's a good idea to try and set up a separate bank account, you know, call it a farm account so that you have a place where you can start really tracking your costs and revenue specific to your operation. 
Okay, another thing to think about before you even get those animals, um, assess your market potential. So who are your customers? What do they want? Who's your target market? And these are four questions you can ask yourself to help figure that out. So who's gonna buy your product? Why will they buy your product if you are selling your livestock products and you're not just using them for your own consumption? What will they pay for my product? And where do they expect to find this product? Where are you gonna sell it? If you are planning to be a, a profitable enterprise, you wanna write a business plan. And a lot of um, loan options will require this. So this is really important. So these are things that a business plan should contain. Mission statement, key values and goals, the products you intend to produce, you want to do a SWOT analysis. So what are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to your livestock business if you're starting one? What are your plans? How much are you needing to invest in this? Do you have a management team? Are you qualified? Do you have a resume? And you want to keep it short, you know, less than 10 pages um, or no one's going to read this. And um, if you click, Michelle, the small farms, website has a really great guide if you're planning to be a livestock business and not just use those livestock and their products for your own use. If you do need loans, there are a few options and there's a lot more information that we can share that we have on Cornell web pages, but the Farm Service Agency's Beginner, Farmer, and Rancher program is one option. The United States Department of Agriculture also has micro loans, there's banks, there's um, micro enterprise loan funds for small businesses, and there's a few listed here that Cornell has more information to if you're interested. Another question I often get is what about grants? And, you know, typically, not always true, but typically grants aren't there to start a farm. They're really meant to enable you to expand a particular aspect of your farm business to make your operation more viable or provide funding to try a new practice on your farm. So I wouldn't rely on grants to really start up your farm, but when the time comes, you should really reach out to your county extension office for more information because there are a lot of really great grant programs out there to help farmers expand operations on their farm. If you're trying to find farmland right now, whether to buy or lease the uh, um, New York Farmland Finder is a great starting place. So on this website, nyfarmlandfinder.org, you can search for farmers that have land and are looking for people to lease that land. So say you're thinking about having sheep, but you need a place to graze them. This would be a great place to start. You can create a profile. Um, and this is run through the American Farmland Trust. And you can reach out to your regional navigator for help. So in Ulster County, that's me and Christian, who's also on the call. And they are across the state. Okay. And so finally, you need to keep records. So from the beginning of this presentation to the end, we've talked about soil, infrastructure, animals, breeds, all of these things, emergency planning, at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you're keeping a record of all of these things. Um, you're gonna need a record keeping system for tax and legal compliance as a farm, but you should also be keeping your animal identification records and have really good ones, animal health records, breeding records. You know, if you wanna figure out what's working and what's not on the, the farm, going back to records is a great way to figure out what to do next. Birthing records, are you having issues? Why? Feeding and grazing records, are you overgrazing? Are you spending too much on feed? Farm and animal yields, so are your pastures improving in yield? Has the yield declined? Do you need to think about frost seeding? Um, is your milk production way down? Why? And then weather logs are also important because you know, if it's hot versus if, it cold, if, if it's cold, that can really influence the yield that you're having on your crops, on your animals, um, if it rained a lot. So you need to keep track of all of these things, or you should, and I highly recommend it. So we covered a lot today. We kind of gave you a very 
high level overview of a lot. Um, we covered regulations, environmental factors, infrastructure needs, breed selection, and then biosecurity planning, emergency planning, environmental management, and we touched on finances. So it's a lot of a little, we have space to have questions now if you wanna dive deeper, but we're also going to do that over the next seven weeks. So next week, we're gonna take a deep dive into forage, and then we'll go through chickens, cattle, swine, sheep and goats, and we'll end with some meat science and regulations and auctions. But with that, we'll take some questions now if there are things you want to know more about. And you can also email us, and those are listed here. So thanks everyone. What questions do you have? You can also put your questions in the chat. Here's a quick question. Will rotational grazing be covered in more detail in forage or is there more detail about that? Yeah, so next week we are going to talk about rotational grazing or two weeks from now, yeah, the next session. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question, Tim. Hey there, I have a question. And maybe this is for next week. <laughs> um, I have about five acres and a fair amount of it's wooded. Do you have recommendations to clear that using animals as opposed to bulldozer? Yeah, that's a great question. What kind of animals do you have right now? Chickens and dogs. <laughs> you have chickens and dogs. Okay. Um, I would like to learn more about what your land is like. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, silvopasture is a way that you can graze animals in okay. wood. Um, you can also plant trees into grass areas and pastures. Um, but I would like to learn more before I give you any advice right now, hearing that you have chickens and dogs. Michelle, Grace, <laughs> anything? Um, yeah, I would, I would like to obviously learn more as well, but you know, if you're, if you're looking for animals that do okay in like a wooded structure or wooded environment, um, you know, we always, uh, talk about, you know, pigs in the forest or, um, goats do well, as far as kind of getting rid of some brush, obviously they would need additional feed, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in addition to, you know, all the weeds and everything that they're eating. Uh, sure. Like yeah. But, uh, you know, pigs and uh, uh, goats generally are what we've seen or I've seen uh, go into the woods. Yeah, goats are really good for browsing. Um, pigs, you have to be a little bit careful. You don't want them to tear apart your woods. Right. Yeah, and our no neighbors are pretty close. So, um, I mean, pretty close, like, because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're like half an acre away as opposed to you know in a distance mm -hmm. um, but the, the the land is pretty flat somewhat marshy and wooded with like little copses with brambles throughout I mean it's pretty rough like it, there nothing's come through here in a while um do you have fencing around this area or do you have timber no <laughs> No. Okay. Let's connect offline more about this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to, I, I, yeah, I don't want to go too deep in the weeds with other, with other folks on the line. Um, I'm, and who was talking, who was just talking now? I'm sorry. I was, I was writing stuff. That was me, Steph. What, I guess what yeah, county okay. are I'm in orange. Oh, you can, uh, if you want to email me, then that, we can talk about that. Okay. Thank you so much, Grace. Mm -hmm. That's my only question for now. Thank you. Great question. And this is a good example. If you have questions like that and you're trying to figure out what to do when you're starting, even with like, yeah, land clearing, land preparation, reaching out to um, your county extension office is super helpful. We've got time to have conversations and make field visits.
There's a question in the chat. Is there a part of the series that talks about homesteading and or is there a resource on Cornell's website for this? That's from Kingston Faraday. So we don't have um, a specific session for homesteading, but um, when we break out by like different species, those might be helpful for um, whatever different ones you're going for. And I'm not sure, is there, does Cornell have a, I know they have the small farms program that has a lot of different resources, but I don't know if they have um, anything specific to homesteading. Do either of you know? I, I wouldn't, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I think there is an online um, homesteading video series that I saw was done by one of the county extension offices, but I don't know if that was recorded or not. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, as far as the information uh, is generally all the same, you know, as far as what you need to feed them, how to fence them, how to take care of them, you know, that we'd be talking about, you know, you just take it as far as, you know, you're not marketing your product for other people, you're using it for yourself. So, um, you know, by contrast, a lot of the information that we talk about can be applied to homesteading just, you know, on a smaller scale. You're welcome. Yeah, I look, I look forward to um, the definite breakout sections that we're going to have. Uh, I think, you know, <laughs> it might bring up more questions, uh, you know, than uh, answers to what people were thinking of doing, depending on how, you know, in depth they want to get. But uh, it's good to kind of get a good overview of all the different uh, livestock options that are available and what their infrastructure needs and feeding needs and everything to make a, a general informed decision on what what animals you want to grow. So I guess we can um, we can certainly hang out for a little bit or if anybody has um, any additional questions you can shoot them to our emails or you can talk to us uh, the following week too so it's up to everybody. I have a quick question. Hello. Yeah, I have a quick question. I ju it just came to mind about goats, um, and and maybe maybe it could be deferred until uh, we get more into goats. But it, it's a quick question. Uh, so I have a couple of goats. Um, that I I kind of call them practice goats because they're they're not performing a real service uh, other than teaching me uh, what goats were all about. And what and I and I am interested in taking them into the forest and and seeing what they can do there because I have a, a very aggressive shrub that I would like to uh, bring under control and I'm hoping that they can help with that. But so far, my experience is uh, the goats are really kind of insecure, uh, being that there are only two of them uh, to be left at any. They don't want to be alone in the woods, so they. Uh, I'm just wondering if their sense of security would uh, improve if they had a bigger uh, herd? Um, or is it, um, um, is it that they're just not familiar with wooded areas that makes them so skittish in, in being, uh, they, they just don't like to be there particularly? Hi, Alan. <laughs> Nice yeah, hi, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's a. Um, I know uh, uh, Stephen Grace might have a little experience as well with with goats, but um, the what breed do you have? You have a smaller breed, right? Uh, well, one of them is is like mostly Sanin, and one of them is mostly Boer. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, they're they're you know uh, medium to to larger size goats, and. Um, uh, I, I think we haven't had them since, uh, you know, uh, they were young. Uh, we got them when they were already full grown. So I don't know if it's a matter of, of how they've been brought up or what conditions they had as they, uh, as they matured. Um, but I know that they are prey species and they don't, <laughs> you know, they consider themselves to be prey species, uh, but they're not secure. You know what I mean? They, they, they want to spend time with people, and uh, it, it's going to be, a, I think, a, a jump or a little transition to get them uh, secure enough to be in a wooded area by themselves without complaining a lot. 
you, what's the what's the saying you can lead a horse to water but can't make a drink I mean you know that it, I mean by nature goats are supposed to be foragers and be a little bit more mm, stubborn I'd say <laughs> but you know not not all of them have the uh, personality to venture off by themselves especially you know with uh, you know, with animal behavior, you think about different shade, shades from the trees, you know, dark spots, light spots, all this kind of affects their behavior, uh, their fight or flight response. So yeah, I mean, it can, it can be tough to kind of make the, make the area seem welcoming when there's only two, you know, so somebody's keeping an eye out for them. Um, and they don't have any kind of, uh, uh, livestock guardian or anything. So, you know, I don't know if anybody else has a better uh, suggestion or talk about it, but yeah, it's, it's tough to make them do what you want to do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Always. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Hi, Alan. I think that's a really good question. I liked your, uh, your phrase there, Michelle, if you can't bring a horse to the water. It's like, I, I immediately thought, well, a lonely goat is a very loud goat. So, I mean, I think goats are like sheep. They're, you know, they have these herding instincts used to being in a herd so if you only have a couple and you're putting them in a new place then I think it's to be expected that they might be yeah a little like shy or timid and yeah I guess my inclination Grace Michelle yeah, feel free to add or disagree but my inclination would be to try it just try it out give them space let them see if they can um, get used to it make small adjustments maybe you can give them like a treat and you take them out there and go from there. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, work in progress, and uh, and I'll update you when we get to talking more about goats. Uh, we'll try a few things. Yeah, get, give them a few extra drops of uh, courage in their water, and uh, maybe that'll help, you know. Courage in their water. Yeah. Yeah. Animal crack <laughs> be very Yeah, <laughs> animal cracker courage. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, I saw I saw a, uh, a a question here in the in the chat. Um, do farms in New York get a tax break? Uh, yeah, well, yes, uh, Tim. That is uh, what they call agriculture assessment, and um, depending on the size of your property, um, if you have over seven acres, uh, you would need to gross ten thousand dollars in income per year off your farm in order to receive um, a reduction in property taxes on your, on your, on your property, um, farm property. Alternately, if you're talking about um, taxes as when you're purchasing, um, there is a tax exemption for when you purchase items for your farm. And that can be found on uh, the New York State Tax website. Um, it's called ST125, I'll type it in there. And uh, that document you bring with you when you go to purchase items to not pay tax on farm items. If anybody else has anything to add? Yeah, use, use the, that form, you know, if you buy, you know, fencing or feed or tractors, uh, if you buy, you know, um, I mean, you name it, uh, it's part of your farming operation. Maybe we can find a link for that and throw it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll, uh, I'll stop share. Helen, I wanna go back to what you said. Christian mentioned in the chat, a good point. You know, your goats imprinted on a larger herd and people and lost that imprint source that goes back to, yeah, they're a herding species. So it might take some time. Great point, Christian. Oh, okay, so just to follow up on that, when you, when you use the word imprinting, it brings to mind a, a window of opportunity in which when, when they go past a certain age, they uh, no longer have the have the tendency to imprint. So I'm wondering if, if you mean it in a, in a, in a broad way so that these two goats that I have now uh, would be able to imprint on a larger herd of goats. I guess that's, that's more or less a, uh, um, 
a natural thing for them, right? I mean, to, to accept other goats or to be... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I would think so if you can bring in more goats and make your herd a little larger. And those new goats could, you know, become part of the crew. Bring in some brave goats that uh, are not afraid of uh, what might be in the for lurking in the forest. Yeah, and don't let them pick up any bad habits from uh, the goats that uh, you have now. So, yeah, with with imprinting, it's it's interesting because you know when you like if you have goats or whatever animal, you know, and you you feed it and you know, you're always near it and, and petting it, you know, those kind of get imprinted on, on yourself or that, that whole um, more pet cycle per se than like, you know, livestock. But um, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's tricky because the, the goats that you have now could imprint the, uh, the more pet way of, of personality as well. So it's just kind of a, you have to figure it out, wait and see, you know? But then again, they could uh, give them more courage to be more independent. There, there's a word, more independence is what I was going for, so. Yeah, I don't want any more mischievous goats. So, so that's what I have now. So I, I'm hoping mm -hmm. that they, they won't be taught, uh, the new goats would not be taught to be eating all the things we don't want them to eat. Yeah. Well, if you have goats, I'm not sure you can escape having mischievous goats. That's what I thought. <laughs> like I said, they're like toddlers, you know, that's how I describe goats to people. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always have to be eating I, everything they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had two goats jump through um, some stone cutout windows uh, two weekends ago and, you know, they're very mischievous. It was on point there. I think it's just going to take some time. All right. Well, hearing no more questions, Grace, Michelle, should we stop the recording? All right. So we will see everyone in two weeks, hopefully.